Yeah, I'm, I'm on staff, and I'm excited to talk to you guys tonight. I'm um, going to be continuing our series on the book of Colossians. We're working through it, looking at the exaltation of Christ, and then how are we to then exalt him in our lives. And so I'm going to be talking about exalting Christ through suffering. Um, so let me pray, and then I will jump in. Uh, Lord God, thanks so much just for the God that you are um, being present in our lives. I pray that you uh, would be exalted, that Christ would be exalted tonight, that we'd even learn through this hard topic of suffering for Christ. Um, God, would you challenge us with the word tonight? Would you speak through me? Um, and would we yeah, be challenged to live for Christ uh, and make much of you? It's in your holy name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, if you have a Bible, uh, turn to Colossians 1. If not, it'll be on the screen. We'll be looking at 1, 24 through 29 tonight. All right, I'll read it for us. So this is Paul speaking to the Colossian church. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone all wisdom that we may present Everyone, mature in Christ, it is for this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. All right, so where we're heading tonight, um, I want to talk about what in the world does Paul mean by filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions? What could possibly be lacking there? And then I want to talk about what is this mystery that he's talking about? And then lastly, I want to talk about what does it look like for us then uh, to suffer well for Christ? What does that look like practically? So, so first, Christ, uh, well, what could be lacking? I mean, when I hear this or read this, I feel like it kind of makes me nervous to think, is there something that I'm not doing right when I believe in Jesus and his death on the cross? Is there something more that I need to do? Do I need to somehow be forgiven for future sins or something? Is the cross somehow not sufficient? Um, kind of makes me nervous thinking about, you know, what if I have to work harder or something to, to save myself? Um, what if the cross and the grace that's provided by believing in Jesus is not enough? And if we look at all of Scripture, we can pretty much discredit those statements right away. It's like that is clearly not what Paul is talking about. And in fact, we only have to look a couple of verses up in Colossians 1.19 to see Paul has just talked about this in his letter to the, the Colossians. He's just said um, in Colossians 19, it says, For in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God reconciled to himself all things in heaven and on earth, making peace by the blood of the cross. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, he made peace. And this isn't like peace as in this warm, fuzzy feeling, like I made a, good, a decision and I feel peace about it. This is this is peace as in the opposite of wartime. This is peace as in God reconciling his people back into relationship with him when they were hostile and turned and completely separate from him. So we know that the, the cross was sufficient. We know it was enough through that verse because he reconciled us by his blood. John Piper puts it this way that when Paul says filling up, He's not saying filling up as in adding to the worth of what Jesus did on the cross or the beauty or the value or the merit for our salvation. He's not adding to the sufficiency of the cross. So what then is Paul saying when he says, I fill up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions? What Paul's saying is, I'm filling up them being seen. You and I, none of us here were at the cross when Jesus was there suffering nailed to the cross for us. You and I weren't there to look up when God, through the form of Jesus, made peace by his blood and his death. We weren't there. 
Um, so what the cross lacked is a personal presentation for you and I, the personal presentation of the gospel. Right after Christ died, the early church exploded. You see this in Acts. Thousands uh, were believing in him every day, believing in Jesus. And these are people uh, that saw Jesus suffer and die on the cross. They saw him three days later, literally, face to face with him, say, that was for you that I died. They saw the presentation of Christ and his suffering for them. So now, when Paul in Colossians says that I, through my pain and suffering, am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, he's saying that through my suffering, Christ can be seen. And Paul knows that uh, it's worthwhile because this is for Christ, and he's making Christ more known. And so he even says, I rejoice in my sufferings for that reason, because I know that they make Christ more known. And I want to talk about how that applies to us. Uh, but first, let me talk about the gospel we are suffering for, and then let's talk about our motivation in doing so. So in doing, to see that, I think explaining the mystery that Paul is talking about is, is a perfect way to do that. Um, now this mystery, it's not actually much of a mystery to us um, as it would have been to them back then. In verse uh, 27, it says, uh, to the saints God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. So the mystery is Christ in you. You and I and the Colossians, um, not just for the Jews or God's chosen people, but now Jesus' uh, death before God to reconcile us back is open to all people. Back in the day, you'd have to go, if you wanted to meet with God, you'd have to go down the street to the local temple. That's where you would meet with God. But now, Christ is in you, so literally you can meet with God because he's in you, and you're able to be uh, before him, perfect in him, righteous by his blood, not by anything that you could do. Um, so, not only that, but we don't have to have a priest like the Jews did back in that day to mediate between us and God, to sacrifice an animal, to forgive um, them their sins. In fact, they didn't even get a chance to go uh, into the presence of the Lord um, getting feedback. Where should I stand? Good? Okay, it's the cable. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. So you don't need a, they didn't need a priest um, to mediate for them. In other words, the priest was the one that went into the presence of the Lord. They couldn't even go into the presence of the Lord. But now because of Jesus, we are able to enter into the holy places. Um, and it says that, actually, in a verse that I wanted to show you, um, into God's presence, and that's in Hebrews 10. Um, in fact, I would recommend looking at Hebrews 9 and 10 there. They're incredible verses. But Hebrews 10, 19 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, that is God's presence, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest, Jesus, over the house of God, let us then draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Of faith. So by Jesus' blood, we're able to enter into the holy places. So now, instead of having to go down to the local temple or to a special place to meet with God, we are the temple. We can meet with God. So that gives us hope, uh, as it says in, in uh, Hebrews 10. There's an eternal hope to come. We know that we're right with God now, and we know that we're right with God to come for all of, all of eternity. Um, as that song that we worshipped at the beginning. There'll be 10,000 years of worship, and then it'll be forever more after that still. Um, so there's hope to not shrink back before God, and then there's hope uh, to not shrink back before others in sharing Jesus, which is what I want to talk about practically for us, and specifically sharing Jesus in our suffering, which is exactly what Paul would want for the Colossians, and that's what he would want for us. So remember I was talking about before, when he said he was filling up the afflictions of Christ, he was saying that he made Christ known through his afflictions. So in other words, people saw Christ on the cross as they saw Paul suffering to make Christ known. 
And Paul knew where his hope was at. He talks about the hope of glory in Colossians. He knew so much that he could say, before Christ, I had it all by the world standards. I had reputation. I had a name for myself. I had notoriety. I had success and worldly possessions. I had comfort and security in life. But I count all of that as loss, he says in Philippians, for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss for the sake of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And look at this. It says, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. I've suffered and count them as garbage in order that I may know Christ and be found in him. Paul knows where his hope is at. So to be honest, uh, suffering is a really hard thing to talk about. I feel like I have a hard time talking about it, not just here, but in my life. We don't really like it. Uh, when it comes in our life, we kind of try to get past it as quick as possible. And if we can't, we try to avoid it. Uh, one second here. I can remember when I was a sophomore in college, I was on project in uh, New Zealand, one of our partnerships at the time. And I was reading the book Desiring God uh, by John Piper, and it talks about, to give you a picture, delighting in God through all of our life. So he talks about worshiping and prayer and scripture. We delight in God through that, and he is our, our sufficiency. He talks about doing it in our marriages. He talks about giving. He talks about uh, doing missions and delighting in God there. And I'm on a mission trip, and so I'm in the coffee shop, I got my coffee, my headphones in, I got my Johnny Pipes, I got my Bible, I'm loving it, I'm just, mm, give me some more of this. So, I have no idea where that came from, but that's, that's where I was. I was loving this idea of delighting in God, I'm on a mission trip, uh, so I'm doing that, I'm, I'm telling people about Jesus, um, and I get to the, the last chapter, uh, which is on suffering, and my mood changes. Whatever that was before, that wasn't my mood when I got to the last chapter on suffering. Um, because he talks about suffering and delighting in God through it. He says, let me give you a picture um, of things he says in the chapter. He says, we are to rejoice in our sufferings. Uh, the author writes and quotes things like 2 Timothy 3.12 that says, indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Uh, he talks about how suffering will come and asks the reader, will you choose to suffer for Christ? And I was writing in the book at the time. I, uh, I looked back at my, my copy. I still have it. And I, to confirm this, I literally wrote things like, I, I'm not so sure about this. Like, it, it makes me uneasy to think that suffering has to come. You know, isn't it that if God lines it up that way, then suffering will come? It's not this, like, for all Christians, they'll, they'll suffer. So I literally am writing this in the chapter. Um, I mean, it's like as if I knew anything. Um, but all that to say that suffering is hard. It's hard to think about it, and it's hard to think about doing it for Christ. It's hard to wrestle with a verse like 2 Timothy uh, 3.12 that says, for all who desire to live a godly life, persecution will come. It's hard. Another reason I think this is a hard topic uh, for me, and I would imagine many of you, is because I really like my comfortable lifestyle. Um, for example, I really like harmony amongst friendships and relationships, and so when I think about um, when given the choice to share Jesus with someone, I'd rather not and maintain a healthy, relation, uh, harmonious relationship with them and not suffer a broken relationship or suffer rejection. Um, another example, I really like our lifestyle and our home and living in Champaign. Um, so when I think about the possibility of moving out of America to tell people about Jesus that never, have never heard, I'd rather not and just avoid any suffering that could come, bad food, dirty living conditions, dogs running in the streets. Um, I'd rather not. So I think the only way that you and I are going to willingly step into potential suffering is to know where our hope is. And that's what Paul knows too, and that's why he's writing that, um, that it's Christ in you, so your relationship with God is, is secure, and you're able to go with it, to him and meet with him, and you're able to make him known to others. 
And he says that's the hope of glory in you. And hope is a crazy thing. Um, and I want to show a clip to even represent that from the Hunger Games, um, which I imagine most have seen, yes? Uh, if not, it doesn't give anything away. So it's from the first Hunger Games. Um, just to briefly set the scene before I show the clip, um, the capital is oppressing the people of the 12 districts. There's persecution, there's oppression, there's killing of people. Um, it's pretty intense when you really think about it. Um, and so Katniss comes along, and I don't really like Katniss. I think she's kind of annoying. Um, has nothing to do with my talk, but just a slam against Katniss. <laughs> Slammer. All right. So Katniss comes along, um, and she's rebellious, and she causes a stir amongst the people um, through her rebellious actions and nature. Um, and the oppressed people start to see um, hope in her. They start to see the hope of freedom. So I want you to watch uh, the short clip as President Snow, the president of the Capitol who's oppressing the people, talks about the danger of hope. She earned it. She shot an arrow at your head. Well, at an apple. Near your head. Sit down. Seneca, why do you think we have a winner? What do you mean? I mean, why do we have a winner? I mean, if we just wanted to intimidate the districts, why not? round up 24 of them at random and execute them all at once. Be a lot faster. Hope. Hope? Hope. It is the only thing stronger than fear. A little hope is effective. A lot of hope is dangerous. The spark is fine, as long as it's contained. So... So, contain it. All right. So, Seneca has no idea what's going on, and Donald Sutherland is a boss. So, I'm a big fan. Um, but I love, what he, I love what he says about hope. Um, it is the only thing stronger than fear. A little hope is effective. A lot of hope is dangerous. So, for us, and our, our hope is much different than their hope of, of freedom. Our hope is secure in heaven and has been secured in, with Christ at the cross. Um, but our hope allows us to walk into suffering for Christ. It's an incredible thing. Um, because if you fear, on the other hand, if you fear losing something, you're going to protect it. So if you fear losing a possession, you're going to protect it. If you fear losing a relationship, you're going to protect it. And even if you fear losing your life, you're going to protect it if you're living in fear. But if we understand the true hope and how eternal it is, that it's not in this world, it's in the world to come with Jesus, that changes things. J. Oswald Sanders uh, tells a, a true story of a missionary. Um, he was an indigenous Indian missionary. Um, he was ministering to his people, sharing the gospel in India. And he was traveling around from tribe to tribe, uh, telling people about Jesus. And he decided one day that he was going to travel to this faraway tribe that he'd heard about, that he knew that didn't know Jesus. And so he travels the long distance, and the trip is longer and uh, harder than he expected. And so he gets there, and his feet are blistered and bloodied from the walk. Uh, they're torn apart. The day is still, there's still daylight, and so he decides that he's going to enter the village and talk to them about Jesus, and so he does. He shares um, his hope in Jesus with them. And the people scorn him. They reject him, cast him out of their city. He's weary from that rejection. He's weary from uh, the long day's journey. And so he falls asleep at the edge of town. He wakes up, and the people are surrounding him. And at first he's frightened because... He's fearful for his life. Uh, he has no idea. They just rejected him, cast him out. Come to find out, the tribesmen uh, tell him that they were curious as to who 
this man was that would travel such a long distance to share this message with them. And they came and they, to the edge of town, and they saw him asleep. And when they saw his feet bloodied and blistered from his journey to share this message with them, they concluded that this must be a holy man. This must be a loving man, that he would come so far to share this message. I love this because this is such a picture of what Paul is saying through his suffering, that they had heard about Jesus from uh, this missionary in India. But it wasn't until they saw him suffering, they saw his feet, that they saw Christ on the cross. It's an incredible picture. And it's examples like this that make me want to make Jesus known. Uh, so badly do I want Jesus to be known. It also makes me realize just how timid I am with my faith, uh, how much I rationalize. They would never accept Jesus. They would uh, laugh me out of the room. Uh, they're too far gone or too hostile. Um, the point that Paul is trying to make uh, is that it's not that they haven't heard about Jesus, that's good, but they haven't seen Jesus. When we put ourselves on the line, we get to show people Christ through our suffering. And I feel like the Lord has, as I've even prepared this talk and thought about this, kind of even shown all throughout at least the New Testament, um, the, the call to even suffer for Christ, that it's not just in this verse. Uh, I was looking at Second Timothy, and I'd read that, before and, and hadn't seen some of the sweet things about um, how worth it is to suffer for Christ. Um, it was like, kind of like they were just new, and I was I just seeing them. It's kind of like when you buy a new car and you see them all over. Um, but it's all throughout, uh, this call to suffer for Christ is all throughout the Bible, and would encourage you as you spend time with the Lord even to, to look for it, see it, wrestle with this. This is hard stuff. Um, I think one of the biggest ways that the Lord will call us to suffer uh, amongst, I, I mean, I don't know, but um, is, is through rejection. Um, I think that's probably one of the things that we fear the most even uh, for in, a, in its simplest form. And I think it's easy to think that since I'm up here that I've arrived in some way that, I've, that I'm not fearful, but I am. I'm fearful uh, to share my faith. Um, I fear rejection and suffering for Jesus. I hear about the Indian missionary uh, on the verge of death for Christ, and that scares me. That scares me to think, what if God calls me to that? So I'm with you. I'm with you in, uh, in the hardship. In closing, but I do want to ask, in closing, uh, when you wake up tomorrow and after that, are you going to choose to enter into suffering for Christ? Because I do think there's a choice there. Are you going to live in the reality that your hope is not in harmonious relationships. So will you choose to share the gospel uh, with your friends and make Jesus known, potentially through suffering? Are you going to live in the reality that your hope isn't in financial security or job security? So will you choose to stand up for your beliefs in the workplace and make Jesus known, risk getting fired, uh, which is suffering for Jesus? Are you going to live... Uh, in the hope, sorry, are you going to live understanding the reality that your hope is not in a comfortable American lifestyle? Uh, your hope is not in the American dream? So will you choose to go to the unreached people groups, to the nations that don't know Jesus, and make Jesus known through your suffering? In your life, are you going to choose to suffer for Christ? Let me pray.